Israeli occupation forces continue targeting residential areas across Gaza with 214 people killed in the last 24 hours. Palestinian health authorities registered over 10,500 killed since October 7th. In Japan, G7 foreign ministers met to address the ongoing Israeli war against Gaza, avoiding calling for a ceasefire and endorsing the Israeli onslaught. And in Mexico, a migrant caravan completed six days of stay in Wixla, a town in the state of Chiapas. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Adreso Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. On Wednesday, the Wafa agency reported a new bombing by Israeli forces in a refugee camp. The note points out that there are a large number of people under the rubble, so the number of dead in this new aggression is unknown. According to local media, the occupation forces targeted the new Seirat refugee camp in central Gaza Strip, and the report added that the attack targeted the residents of the Wafa family and also stressed that the dead and wounded have been transferred amid constant bombardment to the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital. Israel continues to target residential areas throughout Gaza with 214 dead in the last 24 hours. Authorities confirm on Wednesday 10,569 Palestinians killed in Israeli attacks on Gaza since October 7th. In Palestine, the Gaza Strip authorities reported that 70% of the population has been forcibly displaced from their homes due to the Israeli siege against the Palestinian people. According to the recent figures, the population in Gaza is about 2.3 million people, implying that more than 1.6 million citizens in Gaza were displaced in the framework of the Israeli attack. The government media office in Gaza denounced that Tel Aviv's regime's attacks have damaged 50% of homes in all of Gaza and that 10% were completely destroyed. Authorities also warned that half of the hospitals and 62% of the medical care centers in Gaza were out of service. What can I tell you? Bodies torn to pieces, dead bodies lying in the streets, total destruction. Everything is destroyed. When we were walking and we passed by the al Kabala, the tanks passed by throwing earth and mud. What is happening cannot be described. Thank God. Spokesman of the health ministry in Gaza, Ashraf al Qura, said that the Israeli occupation is deliberately targeting health centers in the Gaza Strip. The occupation would deliberately target hospitals in the Gaza Strip and attack medical personnel and staff and called on the United Nations and the Red Cross to protect health facilities and ambulances. The Gaza Health Ministry spokesman also denied the statements of the Israeli occupation concerning the existence of presumed corridors for the displaced Palestinians in the south of the Gaza Strip. We deny the Israeli occupation's narrative about the existence of so-called safe corridors for the displaced south of the Gaza Strip. The occupation speaks of safe corridors, but the reality is that they are corridors of death, turned into traps to trap the displaced. It's been more than a month since the Israeli army began besieging the Gaza Strip and the humanitarian situation that many are now living is unprecedented. For more details, our correspondent Nur Harassin updates us from the Gaza Strip. It is a new morning here in Gaza and it is one day after a whole month of our Israeli war on the Gaza Strip. The situation here is indescribable. What we, even journalists, witnessed here in Gaza over the past 30 days is like nothing that we witnessed over the past years. I myself have been reporting for 10 years now and this is the first time I witness and report what I witnessed during the past four weeks. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, and these are the latest uh, numbers, and these numbers actually shows the how big the catastrophe is on the people of the Gaza Strip. The number of death toll in Gaza over the past week is up to 10,328 Palestinians killed. Among them are 4,237 children, 2,741 uh, women, 
According also to the Palestinian Health Ministry, 2,350 reports of people that were missing, people that are still under the rubble, uh, were filed to the uh, ministry. So actually we're talking about a number in uh, between uh, 12,000 people that were lost in this uh, Israeli war, is really offensive on the Gaza Strip. The ministry also said that 192 of the medical workers, and this of course uh, means nurses, doctors, paramedics, were killed, and this is really offensive on Gaza. 50 Palestinian journalists were killed, and the, uh, this offensive is still uh, going on, while uh, Palestinian journalists, Palestinian doctors, and paramedics left the families and their loved ones and they came here to Gaza's hospitals and around Gaza's hospitals risking their lives to either uh, tell the truth and show the world what is happening here in Gaza and the doctors who were putting all of their energy to save the lives of thousands of Palestinians over the past week we have been reporting about how the health system is deteriorating here in Gaza however hats off to those who are working in the field. Nur Harazin, Tiliso, Gaza. G7 foreign ministers met in Japan to address the ongoing Israeli war against Gaza. The heads of diplomacy avoided calling for a ceasefire and endorsed the criminal operation against Gaza. The limited declaration signed by the European Union, Germany, Canada, the United States, France, Italy, Japan and the United Kingdom merely calls for pauses and humanitarian corridors. They claim that in this way they facilitate urgent aid while Israel continues to commit war crimes. On Wednesday, thousands of Palestinians in Gaza have gone a month without water, 33 days of bombing. The United Nations reported that it lost 92 workers in Gaza. G7 diplomats also called for a two-state solution without condemning Prime Minister Netanyahu's promise of occupation. Israel continues to generate internal tensions with its main partners. On Tuesday, the U.S. Senate blocked the bill that provided, provides aid to Tel Aviv. The bill, sponsored by the Republican majority in the lower house, was criticized by senators. They say conservatives want to delay support for Ukraine, while they accuse each other of wanting to manipulate aid to the North American nation's partners. Republicans also have questioned the amounts of aid to Kiev and are now rushing resources to Tel Aviv, but Senate Democrats reiterate that aid to Kiev cannot be delayed. Parliamentarian disputes have escalated with one lawmaker already censored. In the meantime, Vice President of the United States Kamala Harris pointed out that Israeli President Isaac Herzog the importance of reaching a peace that guarantees freedom and prosperity for the Palestinian and Israeli peoples. Through a phone meeting, the U.S. Vice President stressed the importance of establishing the conditions that guarantee peace, freedom and prosperity. Harris also pledged to continue working with partners throughout the region and also demanded the need to increase stability and security in the West Bank and hold extremist settlers accountable for violent acts beyond the current conflict. On Wednesday, the U.S. House of Representatives approved a resolution of censure against Democrat Rashida Tlaib, the only congresswoman of Palestinian origin, for criticizing the Israeli genocide against Gaza. The resolution, promoted by Republicans' censure representative, received 22 votes from her fellow members of the censure representative party. They accuse her of promoting false narratives. The conservative proposal obtained 234 votes in favor against 188 negative votes and leave Rashid at least one step away from being expelled from the chamber. For many days later, this measure represents the last sign of persecution suffered in the United States by anyone who speak out in defense of Palestine. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Teleso English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. 
On Tuesday, in the Republican state of Ohio, in the Midwest of the United States, they defended abortion and approved an amendment that enshrines it as a constitutional right. The result is considered a significant victory for the abortion movement. It should be noted that in Ohio, former President Donald Trump, a sworn enemy of progressive laws, obtained eight points in the 2020 election. On Tuesday, four states went to the polls, Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, Mississippi, defying different issues through the ballot or had income and consultation on the abortion issue. With these results, Ohio activists are also aiming for a change in the state court. On Tuesday, a caravan of migrants has completed six days of stay in Wixla, a town in the state of Chiapas in southern Mexico. Citizens from several countries such as Guatemala, Honduras, Venezuela, or El Salvador, and other nationalities denounced the lack of attention from the migratory authorities and state that they are desperate due to the delay in the migratory procedures and the lack of response from the agency on which the regularization of the transit to the northern border depends. Many state that due to the lack of guarantees and responses, they have given up continuing their journey. Salvador and organizations that defend the human rights to water express concern that the water authorities' regulations put community boards at a disadvantage. The National Alliance Against Privatization points out that the guidelines of the Salvadoran Water Authority for the implementation of general law of water resources favors the agro-industry sector. The implementation of what is known as the social purpose coefficient and the transparency guidelines raised many doubts in the water defense platforms and could represent more expenses for citizens. The President of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, gave a speech on the upcoming national referendum on the incorporation of the Esequibo region to the sovereignty of Venezuela. Maduro began by alluding to the beginning of the campaign for what would be the seventh consultative referendum. He called on the people to participate on Sunday, December 3rd, in the consultative process, which consists of five questions. He also urged citizens to vote with the best spirit, a fair and sincere vote. Moreover, Maduro blamed colonialism for the current contentious process that has led Venezuela to demand its absolute sovereignty over the Guyana Esequiba. The head of state described the consultative referendum to be held in December as a new stage and called for a campaign that reaches all corners of Venezuela and unites them in the spirit of national reconciliation. The Venezuelan president also rejected the attempts to expand the Monroe Doctrine in the region while specifying that the signing of the No Paris Agreement was a mechanism sponsored by Washington and London that sought to seal the British occupation of the Venezuelan territories. Esta fue la this was the first opportunity where the Monroe Doctrine was imposed to dominate our territory, to divide up our territory. The result of this confrontation was an agreement that sacrificed Venezuela. The British would maintain their occupation over the territory of Venezuela and in exchange would obtain the approval for the invasion of Cuba and to appropriate the Guam Islands and the Philippines. Venezuela would be denied participation and a decisive and influential voice in all the processes that led precisely to the signing of the Treaty of Washington in 1897 and to the nefarious, irritating, null, fraudulent and immoral award of Paris in 1899. The Venezuelan head of state affirmed that historically empires have attempted against the integrity of the country in times of division, for which he urged the people to stand together in defense of Guyana and Sequiba. Venezuela never had a powerful army for the rest of the 19th century. It never had a national state for the rest of the 19th century, and one landowning caudillo replaced the other. Then we arrived at 1897, where the government of the time was in all positions with an ambassador who represented more the interests of the United States than those of Venezuela. Without any connection with national interests, it is sad the role played by those who divided and dismembered. 
And Venezuela has been manipulated and stolen by the empires when we have been divided, disunited, weak. Confronted with each other, that is why it is so important to revitalize the spirit of national union, the national soul. In this context, the Venezuelan president alleged that the United Kingdom recognized the dispute over the Guyana Esequiba after the nullity of the Paris Treaty and therefore agreed to sign the Geneva Agreement. And that is precisely where the intense process of talks and negotiations began, the signing of a set of prior documents to channel. And that is where the core importance lies. In those negotiations, the Kingdom of Great Britain recognized directly and indirectly that there was a pending controversy over the Guyana Esequibo. Which had not been resolved with the Paris Treaty. And it was with the signing of the Geneva Agreement that the Kingdom of Great Britain the colonial power of the occupying Guyana Esequibo accepts the controversy that Venezuela had raised during the whole of the 20th century. In a central element, it leaves aside the arbitrary agreement because if the Great Britain had not considered that this was an element of discussion, It would not have sat down to negotiate. It would not have sat down to debate. It would not have signed the Geneva Agreement. In Costa Rica, floods left around 400 houses affected in the town of Huarco in the province of Cartago. The National Emergency Committee detailed that two of the houses were reported with total damage, so the families were relocated. Authorities reported that the communities of Dobosí, Corazón de Jesús, Las Barrancas, and San Isidro were the most affected. Experts detailed that among the causes of the floods are the overflowing of sewers and the flooding of rivers in the sector. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Fun short break, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. Thousands of far-right demonstrators gathered on Tuesday outside the headquarters of Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez to protest against his proposed law to grant amnesty to Catalan separatists. The demonstration was called by several far-right groups and supported by the far-right Vox Party, represented by the leader of his parliamentary group, Pepa Millán. Some protesters were reportedly dispersed by police charges and tear gas, while six people were arrested for disturbing the peace. On the other hand, Madrid's emergency services said 39 people were slightly injured, including 29 police officers. The socialists are seeking the Catalan separatist party's backing to form a new government and keep the center-left coalition in power. Separatists, on the other hand, have demanded a sweeping amnesty that would include their leaders who fled Spain following their failed 2017 cessation attempt. On Tuesday, Portuguese Prime Minister Antonio Costa announced his resignation after being involved in a wide-ranging corruption investigation. The Public Prosecutor's Office announced in a statement that it was investigating Costa and several members of his cabinet for alleged crimes of prevarication, active and passive corruption, and influence peddling. The investigation, in which more than 40 locations were searched, focuses on lithium mining concessions in the Romano and Barroso mines in the north of the country, as well as a project for the hydrogen energy production plant and another for the construction of a data center, both in Cines. 
In a nationally televised address, Costa said he submitted his resignation to the president. Costa's shocking announcement came hours after Portuguese police arrested his chief of staff while raiding several public buildings and other properties as part of a wide-ranging corruption investigation. I had the opportunity to speak with the President of the Republic twice today. In the terms of the Constitution, it is up for the President to accept my resignation and then decide on the next steps. The last thing I will do is to make a public statement on the decision that the President may take upon and that is his sole responsibility. No, I will not run for the Prime Minister office again. I want that to be very clear. This is a period in my life that comes to an end. Also, as we know, criminal cases very rarely are speedy, so I would not stand by and wait to make a decision. The most important trial is that of my conscience. And with regard to that, I am calm. I am certain that I have no illicit act weighing on my conscience. The families of the victims of the 2018 dam disaster in Kenya have reached an out-of-court settlement with the owner of the facility. In an agreement mediated by Kenya's Human Rights Commission, the owner agreed to pay $8,000 for adults and $5,300 for minors lost in the tragedy. The commission said in a statement on Tuesday, the incident occurred in 2018 when the dam collapsed after heavy rains and water flowed through the fields of a 3,000-acre commercial coffee farm, sweeping away homes and crop farms. At least 47 people, including 20 children, were killed, according to the Kenya Human Rights Commission. Thousands were displaced from their homes as the dam water swept through neighboring villages. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu received General Chan Yuxia, Deputy Chairman of China's Central Military Commission in Moscow on Wednesday. This is the second meeting between Russian and Chinese defense officials in just 10 days. Shogu was present at the Security Forum held in Beijing on October 30th, where they held bilateral meetings. The Russian minister assured in brief statements that they will discuss measures to deepen cooperation, clarifying that unlike the aggressive Western countries, Russia and China do not create military blocs. Far from that, they maintain strategic interaction based on trust and respect. Like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. Before saying goodbye, we want to thank our Caribbean audience, especially the audience of Trinidad and Tobago. We are pleased to share our newscast and contribute to provide an alternative news source of the latest world events. You can find these and many other stories on our website at English. Net. You can also join us on our social medias on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Teresa English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.